I'll go ahead and get started. Um, okay, welcome everybody to the Core Materials Better Concrete, Better Steel session. Uh, this is the first session in our afternoon track on embodied carbon. Um, the session dives into the two of the highest impact materials uh, in the building sector, concrete and steel. Um, it explains why they're carbon intensive, how to reduce the embodied carbon of, the, of concrete and steel today through design and specification. Um, so the learning objectives are displayed here, um, and we'll be following up with a survey after this event um, to get AIA member numbers to report for uh, AIA credit. Um, we'll also be collecting all the questions submitted into the Q&A, um, and if we're not able to answer them at the end of the session, we'll make sure that we do get those answered and we'll post it to the Carbon Positive website. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce our two speakers for this session. Um, I'm going to keep their introduction short so we can dive straight into content and to your questions. Um, but up first, we'll have Frances Yang. Uh, Frances is a Sustainable Structures and Materials Specialist at Arab. She leads Arab's America's Sustainable Materials Consulting Practice, which promotes low carbon structures for our built environments. She serves on the AIA Materials Knowledge Working Group and is Vice Chair of the SEI SC 2050 Sustainability Commitment. Following Francis, we'll have Margaret Hansborough, uh, who is the director for Mighty Earth's groundbreaking steel industry campaign. She authored two steel industry report, reports, uh, Cold Steel Hot Climate and Construction Deconstruction, and led campaign activities that resulted in the largest steel company in the world to commit to carbon neutrality for its European operations. Um, so with that, I will have you take it away, Francis. Can you see this? Can you see what you think you're supposed to see? Yep, that looks great. Okay, great. Um, hello all, it's really good to be with you today. So as Lindsay said, I'm gonna focus on concrete and how to decarbonize our concrete structures through improved design and specification. Uh, I work in the San Francisco office of Eric and Eric is a global firm of engineers and designers of our built environment. So um, just, as a proportion of buildings, uh, just to get an idea of how much of an impact concrete has, um, as a portion of the upfront embodied carbon, concrete is often the largest source, really. Uh, the beige tones on these pie charts indicate the concrete, and they often make up between 40 to 70% of the total for uh, buildings of steel, made of steel and concrete, um, even across different building uses. Uh, use types and this applies to concrete, steel, and even wood buildings um, because, I, you know, concrete is in steel buildings, the the floor slabs, and as foundation for wood buildings. So we really need to to tackle the concrete. Um, uh, but it's really not uh, it doesn't have to be this way. So concrete structures, um, you know, they really don't have to be high in embodied carbon. And to understand this better, uh, it's key to remember what makes up concrete. So um, this is just a breakdown by volume of the main components of concrete. Uh, Portland cement is only 11% here, but then when we look at the embodied carbon of concrete and the sources of that, Portland cement can be up to 90% of the total. And then on a global scale, uh, the cement is uh, can be up to 7% of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. And I like to compare this to flights because we often think of airplane travel as a really high source of emissions, but you see cement um, actually is double that. And so as Architecture 2030 has shown us, um, you know, with the rate that we're building right now and the types of structures that we're building as people move into cities, uh, embodied carbon is such an enormous source of the total carbon from the built environment over the next 30 years. Uh, we, we just really have to um, tackle concrete if we're going to get to zero by 2050. So in Arab, um, we've uh, done a study a couple years ago looking at a whole bunch of uh, different technologies and methods of reducing uh, the embodied carbon of concrete, getting to what we would call lower carbon concrete. Um, and you can see here, there's, there's a lot, there's over 40 that came out in this report. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna be able to focus on a few of them um, today with limited time. 
but I'm trying to pick out the ones that I think you can um, you know, use uh, most readily on the most types of projects and also the ones that are really emerging in um, the Americas, uh, particularly North America. Uh, and so to kind of group these more succinctly, uh, we could talk in broad categories of number one, using less Portland cement, uh, and then number two, uh, starting to use carbon and as a, a ingredient and actually um, an input in, into concrete. And then, um, and then lastly, reducing waste, not just waste in construction, but also thinking about waste in, in the amount of materials we use in design. So, uh, you know, with reducing cement, I think that traditionally uh, we've seen the industry talk about percent replacement, right? Percent uh, recycled content, actually, sorry. Uh, so recycled content as being that um, the target or the metric that we often use of trying to lower the embodied carbon of concrete. But really what we've uh, seen already is that it's um, the, the culprit is the cement. And when we uh, just use recycled content, unfortunately, we end up sometimes with um, the, the procurement leading to in increasing the amount of total cementitious. And so we're not actually reducing the cement in the proportion that we're specifying for recycled content. And this is an extreme case. I haven't luckily seen a project that's taken it this far. But, um, but the focus here, the point is that we uh, would like to talk, start talking about cement limits and, and uh, the absolute quantity of cement instead of using recycled content. And that is something we've done um, in this new code. So the counties of Marin and Alameda came together with Bruce King of Let's Global Building Network, uh, who really came up with this idea, um, as, well as, as well as the Carbon Leadership Forum. And this new code is meant to limit the amount of greenhouse gas emissions associated with making concrete. And the focus is limiting cement, or you can also use other technologies that ultimately show reduced embodied carbon in the concrete use on projects. And Eric's role was to develop the numerical limits um, provide some technical guidance and also provide support on the pilot projects. Um, uh, and uh, besides the ones that Marin is, is already implementing because they have adopted the code. And this has been funded, which I thought was really interesting is it was funded by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District because they see how the cement plants in the Bay Area, the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions from them um, uh, are on par with all of the emissions from all the buses in, in the whole Bay Area. Um, and so that, that was quite uh, alarming to me and, um, and also you know, a good understanding, having a better understanding of why they cared about finding another way to curb uh, cement uh, greenhouse gas emissions because they worked with the cement plants directly for you know, many years now and they've kind of hit a threshold. So it was really interesting to think about how project teams uh, could contribute to just reducing the demand for the cement to begin with and thus also leading to less emissions from the cement plants. So the last thing to note is that we um, are targeting concrete in this code because there's this big gap that we saw with the Buy Clean California Act. Um, Buy Clean California passed in 2017 and um, it covers four major construction materials but not concrete. So we wanted to, to fill that gap. And the idea is that, um, you know, these local codes would help to influence um, higher level codes and we'd follow a trajectory that has been successful for turning green building initiatives in from the local level into more widespread code requirements at the state level. So it's starting small, but really the intent is to go big. And now here's the crux of the code. It's really kind of comes down to these numerical limits. Um, like I said, uh, one way is on cement and another way is on embodied carbon or on environmental product declaration. What you see is the metric of global warming potential, embodied carbon, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, global warming potential. They're all um, kind of the same thing when you're talking about materials. Um, so as um, uh, the other really helpful key component of this is that we have the National Ready Mix Concrete Association's industry-wide EPD to work from. And this EPD really helps set um, a baseline to be able to set our limits. 
So um, you can see from these bar charts, the other thing that we was really important to us to do was to substantiate where we set the limits. So the limits are the, the dark, um, the solid black lines, and then the NRMCA average is a dashed line. And then we used data that was collected from the uh, Structural Engineering Association of Northern California uh, for over 300 mixes collected recently. And we're able to show that where the limits are set, you know, it is achievable, but it also takes intention. Um, the other thing is that to note is that it is important, uh, you know, this process we think is replicable, but because there are so many things that factor into what uh, concrete suppliers are able to do, um, the, you know, materials available to them wanting to still try to use local materials and um, what technologies are available, even like market and regulatory conditions that um, it's important that the numerical limits are reassessed and, and you know, set appropriately for, for any region that wants to use this type of code. So um, the biggest trade off to reducing cement is uh, using replacements like fly ash and slag. Um, the ones that are most available right now, um, the, the early strength gain is delayed. And it's lower than mixes using plain or pure Portland cement concrete. However, these mixes do eventually reach strength and often exceed the strength of Portland cement concrete after the 28 days, which is the typical data strength that we design, you know, we specify for the design strength. Um, but we can use this to our advantage and, um, you know, basically separate out the uh, elements of the concrete um, in the building that can take this, you know, they wouldn't see the design strength till much later. So foundations, lower level columns, shear walls, um, there, there's actually a, a lot of parts of the building that are fine with um, not gaining strength till, till later. But of course that requires some, some good coordination with the whole team, especially the concrete construction team. The other thing we heard a lot in our stakeholder group and in coming up with this code is that um, suppliers often see specifications that are just overly prescriptive and they unnecessarily limit the ability to offer lower carbon concrete mixes. So part of the spec guidance that we helped um, that Eric developed and is on the Marin County website um, is trying to help designers or engineers e examine their specs and remove these barriers when they don't really need to be there and ultimately making like that, that tightness and prescriptiveness in, in specs more of an exception and just when needed and not, not the norm. Now, um, you may be thinking, you know, fly ash, slag, these cement replacement materials that we have right now, they are running, uh, we want them <laughs> to run low. We want them to eventually be obsolete. Um, and uh, so I think it's important to note too that some other, uh, Pozzolanic or supplementary cementitious materials that are coming up um, that are uh, exciting. Um, so this in particular is a gla ground glass pozzolan and it's utilizing the um, glass that would otherwise go to landfill. So, you know, not wanting to divert what's already being recycled well, but um, what's going to the landfill, there's quite a lot of it and uh, building product ecosystem uh, really helped to catalyze this. This is from their website. And if you want to learn more about this, um, you can go to either of these websites and Positive is an actual manufacturer and they have quite a few projects now done on the, um, the east coast of the United States. And so now, um, now for that second bucket of, uh, you know, carbon um, be actually being absorbed or taken, uh, sequestered in concrete. And I think this is really exciting. Um, they're not all uh, readily available yet. Um, that's, there's quite a range here. But um, just to give you a sampling, the, um, you know, solidia and carbocrete, they uh, only really make precast, but um, CO2 is injected in the process and, um, and, and Sledia, there's actually some other things they do as well. Um, Carbon Cure, in addition to um, precast, they have they are able to fit on to uh, ready mix operations. Um, and um, then the, the the top one is really trying to illustrate Blue Planet aggregate, uh, which um, is taking uh, like a carbonated solution and then um, the fines from crushed concrete to use as aggregate and then um, offering clean crushed concrete for coarse aggregate, but then the fines making new coarse aggregate by coating these fine particles 
um, with the, the um, basically a calcium carbonate um, and uh, basically making rock. So um, it's really this reversal of what happens um, when we make cement, Portland cement, of emitting the CO2, and, and it's, um, it's actually reversing that and making calcium carbonate. So those are exciting, I think, because with um, these multiple, you know, especially if we use multiple technologies, there is theoretically a way to um, think about making carbon neutral concrete. Um, and then lastly is the idea of design, right? Um, just how much concrete we use. On the left is one of many signature designs by the architect engineer Pierre Nervi, who's famous for shaping reinforced concrete and really pushing the technical technology of the time and it produced amazing spans and heights and just visually stunning results. Um, I find it quite striking in resemblance to some of the 3D print explorations out of um, Philip Bloch's uh, uh, group in um, research group at ETH Zurich. And again, they're using what is now the leading edge technology um, and inserting material, you know, this concept of stream material only where you need it. And it's also generating some really fascinating shapes and patterns. So within Eric, we did this study um, just uh, looking at the range of types of slabs and analyzing these different reinforced concrete systems to see just how much embodied carbon could be saved through using more materially efficient systems. And what we found was that compared to probably one of you know, the most popular I'd say right now is that flat slab, a uh, two-way flat slab um, with and without PT, but um, we uh, are setting the flat slab without PT as if we call that one, then um, we compared all these other systems um, to that and found that you, we could be talking about, you know, saving a significant amount of material um, down to only a third um, if we were to use one of near V's shaped slabs. And these are all equivalent in their um, functional performance in terms of strength, stiffness, and fire rating. So then we went further and combined that with, the, you know, the material efficiency with the cement reduction strategy as mentioned earlier. Um, and, but they're just the ones that don't rely on proprietary technologies. And we found that we could cut the embodied carbon of a concrete slab down to almost a quarter of what we see in practice today, you know, when like nothing is really, no attention is being paid. Um, so and this is both for multifamily buildings and office. So multifamily is blue and office is gray. Um, and uh, even if we weren't like so ambitious to use a, a nervy slab, um, and we're just kind of progressive, <laughs> somewhat, somewhat more progressive, we could still cut the embodied carbon down by about half just being more conscious in the design specification. Um, so, so that sums it up. This is um, just a quick list of all the things um, I mentioned and, and the things that I hope that you can take on your current projects, on your next, you know, all your future projects. These should be things that you could think about for um, all your projects now. And um, uh, I yeah, hope this was helpful and, and just really trying to think about concrete and, and the real opportunities that we have with concrete. Thanks, and I need to turn it over to Margaret now. Excellent, thank you, Francis. That was a great uh, presentation and full of uh, a few a few different angles of that story in Marin County that I had not heard before. So that was helpful. Um, let me just get set up here. Very good, Francis. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Excellent. Uh, you need to go to presentation mode, though. Yep. Awesome. All right. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and my name is Margaret Hansbro. Uh, I am a campaign director with an organization called Mighty Earth. Um, and I'm here to talk about steel and decarbonization of the steel industry. Um, some of you uh, probably have, have um, if you're, you're a frequenter of the, the carbon positive community, you may have heard some of this before, but some of it will be new. Um, and so hopefully this will kind of complement um, Francis's uh, kind of technical how-to with more of that bigger global how-to and how to really leverage the, the, the market potential of, of your company and, and, and your role within your company um, and the AEC community at large. 
Uh, a bit about Mighty Earth, uh, you, may, you may not have heard of us. Uh, we're a global campaign organization that works to protect tropical forests, oceans, and the environment. Um, we, we focus on um, a lot of different issues, but oftentimes breaking the link between destructive environmental practices um, driven by, by industry um, and um, things like deforestation from, from agriculture um, and breaking those links within the supply chain um, and, and, and then also driving uh, voluntary and, and, and regulatory action uh, for change in terms of, of clean energy and, and um, other emissions impacts. Um, a bit about how we work. So um, kind of how we approach the global steel industry. About two years ago, three years ago, um, there was not a lot happening when it came to heavy industrial emissions or embodied carbon. Um, carbon emissions from, from super emitting um, industries like, like steel and, and cement, um, chemicals um, and things like that. And so when we took a look at the space and we said, well, steel is a really important change agent, not just um, for steel's sake, and it's you know approximately seven to nine percent of all global emissions. But because if you can do it with steel, you can do it with almost anything. So we'll talk a little bit about um, kind of what it's going to take to de decarbonize steel. Um, but it is um, it is a very different kind of material than um, than than cement and concrete. Um, but it has a lot in common with it too when it comes to the industrial heating and, and whatnot. But, you know, we, we set out um, to, you know, demonstrate and, and display the risk um, the industry um, both had in, internally, but also the risk from industry in terms of the, the outsized climate emissions from steel. Um, and, and a lot of what we do is, is by exposing that risk through campaigns, markets campaigns, um, and activating supply chain, uh, whether it's construction or auto uh, within the steel steel um, sector or steel industry, um, we we push industry toward voluntary action and commitments. So you know, seeking out really specific climate uh, and environmental commitments um, that the company can then realign uh, their business strategy around, and hopefully realigning that marketplace. And by by you know driving kind of raising the bar within the market. Um, we, um, you know, uh, we have seen a, a great deal of policy realignment. So once the incentives are changed, that helps, you know, shift policy conversations where we can, you know, finally get to a place where we can really cement, uh, no pun intended, um, uh, some of these changes into to, to the policy setting. Um, and, you know, Francis mentioned BiClean. BiClean is a great example of, of, of uh, one policy out there that has started to gain traction in other states and, and likely federally. Um, but you know, clean procurement policy um, will, will be a, a helpful driver for all of this. But um, so over the last few years, we've, we've sought to activate um, some of the top steel companies in the world um, and some of their biggest customers in, in the construction and, and built environment world. Um, and so, you know, ArcelorMittal, um, we mentioned that at the top a little bit, uh, number one steel company in the world, um, huge outside, outside uh, emissions in terms of, of the global industry almost 1% of global emissions. Um, but we also you know, looked at some of the, technically from a carbon standpoint, some of the best performers out there uh, like Nucor, which uses mostly uh, almost entirely EAF production, so electric arc furnace production, which is inherently lower carbon, um, but had, had still had a lot of dirty electricity and still does in its supply chain. Um, and so what you'll kind of start to see is there's kind of different um, approaches to the different kinds of steel making that are needed in order to decarbonize across the industry. So one of the things I've uh, tried to, to really hammer home the last few years is that uh, business as usual is over. <laughs> if you were looking at uh, IEA models and, um, and, and other things like that of, 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 you know, kind of, you know, business as usual scenarios, that day is done. Um, and, and, you know, make that your daily mantra. If it wasn't already in 2020, um, then uh, it, it certainly is, is now. Uh, the business as usual is over. Uh, we have a heck of a task in front of us when it comes to reducing emissions from steel, cement, um, and other, other heavy industrial um, uh, industries. And so by 2050, we have to reduce more than one gigaton. Um, and that is an enormous task. Um, it will only happen through a, you know, a portfolio approach, um, but you know, uh, in, above all, it's going to mean enormous investments in breakthrough technology when it comes to changing the nature of industrial heat 
uh, for steel and cement and other things. Um, but then also um, completely rethinking, as, as Francis talked about, design and, 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 and use of existing buildings and infrastructure. Um, I know there's other sessions on existing buildings and infrastructure, so I'm not going to dwell on that um, at much. But um, when it comes to um, you know, kind of winning the game, particularly in the near near term, um, businesses that are able to rethink um, what what um, their business strategy is uh, to decarbonize are going to be the ones who are going to be able to um, adapt to to um, uh, to meet the needs of of of, uh, of a 1.5 world. Uh, so important to anchor, anchor when you talk about steel, which is an energy intensive trade exposed industry, which has, you know, kind of unique things about, about that industry, um, that when we're talking about where steel is made and where it's um, consumed, we're still very much talking mostly about Asia. Uh, China is about half the ball game, um, an enormous outsized uh, impact there. Um, and um, the rest of Asia, when it comes to Japan, Korea, uh, Indonesia um, and India, certainly. Um, this is both where there's enormous growth for new buildings, new infrastructure, um, all the above, new consumer goods like cars and, 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 and all kinds of transport um, and, and white goods. But also, um, you know, it's, it's the, the, the home of, of, of production and has grown enormously over the last many years. And that is where demand is expected to grow the most, is, is in Asia and particularly in Southeast Asia. And so, as we start to talk about kind of what is the role of the Americas, um, I think it's kind of helpful to orient yourself. And it's also about our, our impact, um, whether it's the United States or Mexico or Brazil, um, to, to use what uh, kind of our, our role within the mar global market um, to, to be a catalyzing effect um, in terms of, of, of um, kind of a race to zero uh, in terms of carbon. Um, and so, you know, North America is, is really just around 5% uh, consumption, 7% production, uh, Latin America, another 3% across the board. Um, but, you know, again, leveraging um, that, that strong foothold um, and, and really thinking through what's the, what's the approach um, and ultimately perhaps what is the competitive advantage for uh, places like the United States and Mexico. And, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so, you know, steel is made essentially two different ways. Your primary steel production or integrated steel production, also known as blast furnace production. So this is what you conjure up in your mind of uh, coking coal, iron ore in a very, very, very hot oven um, and, and being, uh, you know, uh, reduced um, and, and, and reformed um, to, to make steel. Um, and that is still about 70% of global production. Uh, and um, in the US, it's about 32% of our, our production. Um, but more and more as primary steel has, has aged and then been recycled within our economy, that has allowed kind of probably, you know, one of the greatest essentially material and energy efficiencies um, inherently, which was just melting down old scrap metal, uh, old scrap steel and um, refabricating, re, 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 recasting it into new steel. And for, for most of you all in the AAC community, you see that as recycled content, right? That's probably how, how you, you see it in the marketplace. Um, but, you know, this is made possible through, you know, electric arc furnaces and, and mini mills. Um, and they use a humongous amount of electricity. Usually they're the biggest thing on the local electricity grid, wherever they are, whether it's in Seattle or South Carolina uh, or throughout Alabama, uh, where there's a lot of EAF production. Um, you know, this is um, uh, inherently less carbon intensive, but it still presents opportunity for further carbon reductions. Um, and so when we talk about kind of the global and, and kind of the, the, the Americas approach, um, there'll probably be different asks, layer demand signals is something I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, um, but depending on kind of what you're buying, but um, inherently you, you, you wanna be focused when it comes to um, from specifications all the way up to corporate commitments, sending a, a single demand signal that you want low carbon materials and you want them from a, car, a company that is, is producing or committed to low, uh, low and zero carbon uh, targets for 1.5 world. So a little bit more about kind of the top producers in the Americas. I stuck to kind of the, the, the top three and, and, and basically, you know, uh, under the, the top 15 in the, in the world, US, Mexico, and Brazil, and kind of what they have in common um, and then what, what's a little bit different about them. 
Um, so you, the U.S., you know, I already mentioned the, the blast furnace versus EAF production, EAF being inherently carbon, in, uh, carbon less intensive. Um, but, um, you know, Mexico is actually has a very similar uh, breakdown um, and a lot of their, um, so a lot of the things that, you know, make sense in the U.S. Uh, will likely make sense in, in Mexico in terms of, of some of the asks of different companies. Um, and in Brazil, it's actually, it's totally flipped on its head. Brazil is a country that has um, a lot of iron ore um, in of itself. And, um, and, and so there's been kind of a, always a long-term competitive advantage there in that they have cheap local um, iron ore um, and, and, and uh, primary steel making is, is still um, um, the, the primary uh, uh, production method there. Um, but you know, something else you'll see in, in all three of these places is ArcelorMittal. Uh, it's the number one steel company in the world. Uh, it makes uh, oodles more than any other single company. As I mentioned, it's almost 1% of global emissions. Um, that is a company that has a, you know, a predominant uh, presence in, in North and South America. Um, and being able to send signals from the construction community to that company to produce not just low carbon products, um, but low and but have a commitment to a, a 1.5 uh, degree trajectory with 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 real climate and near term commitments is going to be really key because um, that company has to start seeing that kind of demand from the marketplace um, and enough demand that it, it really uh, gives them the, the, the spark that they need uh, to then really start to make, be making the, the kinds of policy and, and other uh, uh, financial investments and breakthrough technology um, and, and other solutions to, to lower their carbon footprint um, and start putting out low carbon uh, materials um, all around. So as I already mentioned in the US, um, and, and I think you know, this is uh, somewhat similar likely for Mexico as well, um, given that they have a very similar, almost the same breakdown between EAF and, and blast furnace production. Um, you know, if you were to actually you know, have 100% recycled uh, metal uh, for, for, for you know, some kind of structural project um, and powered by 100% renewable electricity, you could get it up to an additional 44% um, carbon reduction um, uh, it, it, just with that combination um, of, 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 of fuel switching and, and a production method switch. Um, you know, this is based on, on some of the, the, what we know about um, EAFs in the US. Um, but when you look at the big carbon pie, I think back to that big, big, so big uh, global um, pie chart of, of where most of the carbon is, it's still in that blast furnace production. So while it's incredibly important to be demanding um, and specifying, um, you know, as low uh, global warming potential um, through EPDs and, and product specific EPDs um, and, and facility specific EPDs, we still have to be, think about what are those layer demand signals. Um, so while we're, we're demanding EAF, 100% renewable electricity, lowest embodied carbon uh, potential, um, we also have to be sending the signals to the arcelor middles of the world and the blast furnace production producers um, that they need to be changing their ways too, um, and that they need to be putting out um, commitments um, and, um, and 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 real um, products into the marketplace uh, to begin to offer um, uh, in, you know for construction and 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 um, infrastructure as well. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about you know, the the different pathways for steel. Um, so I've talked a little bit about industrial heating. Um, for steel, what's going to be required is about a 10, 15 year horizon to commercialize new kinds of industrial heating processes. So that will fundamentally displace coal um, as um, both, you know, electricity source, as raw energy source, um, but, you know, really, um, uh, fundamentally uh, uh, dis displacing uh, what we know is kind of the typical blast furnace production process. Um, most likely, and there's a series of pilot projects happening around the world, um, primarily in Europe, but um, a few in, in Asia as well, um, that is experimenting and, and, and beginning to pilot um, what uh, hydrogen can do to displace um, that kind of in uh, industrial heat. Um, and so um, kind of there's a variety of things happening. But there's a very narrow window for, for that kind of technology. It, 
it needs about 10, 15 year uh, on-ramp uh, to, to go from um, being able to pilot uh, with a mix of pu public and private financing to where it could be commercialized widely and displace um, uh, coal burning um, uh, production um, uh, widely. Um, so in addition to um, you know, hydrogen technology, um, we, we advocate for what we call the, kind of the portfolio approach, um, which is um, uh, you know, making sure that we're investing kind of on several fronts um, in terms of uh, what we're, we're, we're asking steelmakers to do. So carbon capture for industry, um, that's something you know, we don't advocate for for the power sector, certainly, um, but for things like steel and cement, it may and, and will likely be necessary. Um, so, as, but that's still, much of that is still being piloted and just starting to scale. Um, and so, uh, again, um, that, that requires uh, uh, kind of a, several years on ramp. Uh, clean electrification, as mentioned, um, inter additional energy efficiency, um, and other mitigation and net reduction. So, you know, where there are still unavoidable emissions, um, you know, if a company is on a 1.5 pathway, we do advocate for them to, to, to mitigate and abate um, their existing emissions through, through natural carbon reductions. Um, we, it's a, a position we have one because uh, the time value of carbon tells us that everything uh, preserved in terms of the natural environment um, is better done now rather than 2050. Um, and so a lot of folks talk, talk about, um, well, if you know, we're, it's 2045 and, and we still have say, you know, five, 10% of emissions that are, are still just too hard to abate, um, then, um, then, 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 then we'll, we'll, we'll offset that, those emissions somehow. Um, you know, our position is uh, carbon neutrality now, uh, net zero um, uh, on a 1.5 trajectory um, for, for all industries. Um, and so that, that is what we call kind of the portfolio approach of technical pathways. Um, on the market side, um, we, you know, we, we think it's one critical, and, and we started to see this in the marketplace in the last two years, um, we need wider transparency, um, and so as, as much um, EPDs as, 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 as we can have, both at that product specific and then the facility specific. Um, and then we need to be able to move towards a performance pathway. So um, we need to be able to continually raise the performance um, for, for, for these, these products and these facilities so that um, you know, what is good performing uh, today uh, will only be maybe a B average five, six years from now. Um, uh, talking about layers of demand signals, I mentioned that you know, as, a, as AEC community, we need to be sending um, you know, layer demand signals, both that we want low carbon products now, um, but we also want um, companies to commit to um, you know, what, what, what Ed and, and, and team have put out there, which is kind of the, the carbon positive 1.5 framework um, that's very aggressive and very necessary. It's based on carbon budgets and not models. Uh, it's based on, on what we know about the existing carbon budget. So those, those targets are, are not arbitrary. They may seem um, quite steep, um, but they are absolutely necessary and they're mission critical. Um, we also uh, push for voluntary standards. So um, you may all be familiar with something called Responsible Steel. It's, a, it's an issue that started a, a couple of years ago and it's um, kind of the, the, the beginning stages of, of uh, responsible steel certification uh, that's based around kind of 12 standards, which include emissions, but also other things like biodiversity and human rights and labor and things like that. And so we think it's important to have kind of a, a verifiable third party standard. Uh, and that's why we, we, we are supportive of, of responsible steel. Um, but ultimately, hopefully, you know, that, that, that voluntary standard, that realignment, it can unlock new value where um, low carbon is, is, is the new um, value um, for these companies. Uh, so I'll, I'll conclude with kind of just the, really the hard ask. Um, it's, you know, it, for us at Mighty Earth, it's, it's all about getting companies to commit to um, architecture 2030s, um, carbon positive framework. Um, and, and to get them and to get, you know, whether you're a firm or a construction company, a producer, somewhere in the supply chain, somewhere in the design phase, everybody committing to, 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 to move towards the same framework goals. Um, again, those layer demand signals that I talked about, um, products and company-wide alignment. Um, you don't wanna be buying um, 
really uh, low emission steel from a company that s supports things like uh, uh, um, uh, climate denial or um, is just, you know, uh, uh, not yet uh, on a 1.5 uh, trajectory themselves. Um, so in a lot of ways, I think it's helpful, again, kind of the rethink and the redesign uh, to orient um, uh, from a business perspective that this is not just about reducing the embodied carbon of any single project, but about planning how you will decarbonize your whole business strategy. And I think that brings in the elements of existing buildings, of material efficiency, of um, different kinds of designs, what kinds of projects you are going to go after, et cetera. Um, and so for, for uh, the final kind of specific call to action for AEC community, um, you know, again, across the board, demand for EPDs um, from all of your steel suppliers um, and, you know, no more industry averages, uh, very specific EPDs per facility, per product, um, and, and get those companies to, to, to align uh, behind a, a 1.5 uh, commitment. Um, and, you know, I think it's, really, really important this year that the AC community send a, just a, a resounding signal to steel suppliers. Um, and, and that signal would be lighting up behind the, the carbon positive framework that, that Ed and, and team have laid out um, with a 65% reduction by, by 2030. Uh, that's all from me. Um, feel free to contact me if, if you have follow up um, and I think we'll move on to Q&A now. Great, thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Francis. Um, let's see, Francis, if you can turn your video back on. Perfect. All right, so we do have a few questions that have come into the Q&A. Um, and again, thank you. Thank you both for that insight and for the detailed work. Um, let's see. So one question for you, Margaret. Um, if you're saying it will take about 10 to 15 years for the largest steel manufacturers to shift to decarbonizing steel, how can we meet the 2030 challenges if these companies aren't signing on right now? It seems like we might need more ag advocacy to get where we need to go. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a steep, steep hill to climb. I think you know, it's important to tell the truth and, 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 um, and be really real uh, about the challenge before us. Um, that being said, I think you know, when you really look at the built environment and particularly here in the Americas and, and, and you look at US and uh, in Canada, you know, thinking through what, you know, by 2025 and 2030, what are those, I think it's 40% today, 50% uh, in 2025 and 65% and by 2030. I think it's, in some ways, it's kind of seeing the, the, the tools on the table and, and rearranging them in a new way. So what are those decisions that you're gonna make about design, um, what projects to take on, um, you know, how will, um, some of the other things um, like uh, modular design and, and prefab design, you know, how can that all be a part of, of, of that portfolio approach to reducing emissions in the built environment? Um, and then when it comes to steel specifically, um, we have to send a loud and clear signal. The faster their customers sign up um, for a 1.5 scenario um, and with these, uh, you know, with these, these um, important and critical um, carbon positive framework milestones, um, the um, faster they will have to move. Um, and they're not gonna go, they're not gonna, you know, have to, they're not gonna do this on their own. They're gonna need partnership from the AEC community. They're gonna need partnership from a policy perspective that there will, and, and starting in Europe, um, you know, you're starting to see really serious in the billions of dollars. It's gonna take probably billions more to transform, particularly the industrial heat side of things. Um, and, and some of those breakthrough technologies, um, but they, it has to be done. Um, and what gives um, those companies the biggest incentive to do that is when they see a very clear demand signal, uh, when they hear um, up and down their supply chain, but particularly in construction, which is about half of all their, their sales, um, uh, calling for uh, the same things across the board. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you all. Unfortunately, we do have to end this one to get to the next session. Um, so if you're gonna be continuing in the embodied carbon track, the next session is forest and the trees. We're talking about um, climate smart forest product procurement. Um, and just a final thank you to Francis. Thank you, Margaret, for your insight. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all in a future session. Thank you. Thank you.